In the same survey, you reported numbers about support or lack of it for a new Pepsi Center by Asset Entertainment and giving them a tax break. They fared a little bit better. The, the Ascent owns the Nuggets and the Avalanche, and they want to build a center down by Elitch's. But to do so, they want tax breaks from the city of Denver. The, the poll said people don't want them to have tax breaks, although only, it was only about 55% opposition to that. And um, if the people in the, in the suburbs, Arapahoe County and Jefferson County, essentially got uh, Coors Field built in the last election, if they're persuaded to vote for a new stadium, it could still pass, even if it's a wa if it's a Washington, Denver, and Boulder, uh, Arapahoe and Jefferson County can carry a, a referendum on a new stadium. And back to Kevin Flynn, the talks between the city and the Pepsi people, Asset Entertainment, uh, are not very friendly. Uh, they've well, they're a little friendlier than they were before when they're actually walking out on each other. Now they're back talking. And uh, I, I was talking to one participant uh, this week, Don, and I said, well, have the doors been closed with this uh, uh, response that the city gave just this week, by the way, from the mayor's office to Ascent, a response to their proposal that essentially they get to keep everything that in the way of sales taxes. And he says, well, if the doors have been closed, let's just say that the windows remain open so they can still jump in the windows if they want. Uh, they're my perception is that they're still pretty far apart. They're not sharing details with the public. They're trying to do this behind closed doors. They said they don't want to negotiate in the newspapers, Don. I, I pointed out it's much cheaper, you know, <laughs> 35 cents versus whatever they're paying their lawyers. <laughs> uh, thanks to Guy Kelly of the Rocky Mountain News. Kevin Flynn, one other topic, just a paragraph of two. This week, the city council and the mayor signed off on uh, medical benefits for the gay and lesbian community. And one of the things that we haven't really written about uh, as much as we should have is what happened to the opposition here. It passed 12 to 1, which I think, or 11 to 1. It would have been 12 to 1, but Polly Flobeck was absent. Uh, we, we predicted that a couple, a couple weeks ago. The, the opposition just totally fizzled out. Kevin Flynn, City Hall reporter for the Rocky Mountain News. Next, let's talk about trains. There seems to be more interest now after decades of passenger service going down and down. Kit Miniclear? Well, Denver, the Front Range, and maybe even the nation are about to take a giant step back to the future. Uh, some 75 uh, cities across the country are starting, including Denver, starting or expanding new rail systems. Uh, Denver is getting streetcars again. We're about to have uh, eight miles plus down to Littleton. We've got five miles here in town. They don't call them streetcars, but that's what they are. And the big thing is we, we have the opportunity to turn Union Station into our own gateway or our own front door again. What, there is a substantial amount of vacant land, land around Union Station, and uh, people who want rail traffic see this as a great opportunity. Well, there's 130 acres immediately west of Union Station, and half of that is owned by the Trillium Corporation, which has all sorts of plans for putting in very fancy uh, homes, or not homes, but condos, apartments, buildings, uh, restaurants. But they're willing to work with the city and with other people who, I mean, I, I attended a rail conference in uh, Washington last week, and uh, it was outlined, uh, people from Denver outlined all sorts of new plans. Why now is the time to do something with Union Station if they're ever going to do it? They've been talking for 30 years about doing something with rail. The RTD's Market Street Terminal is going to be filled up within three years. Greyhound has to move. Uh, it would not be difficult to put a light rail thing into Union Station. It's very close. They're talking about putting in heavy rail or commuter rail between Denver and Fort Collins and Loveland. People up there want it. They want to be able to go by train rather than commuting. Uh, and you get buses going in there too. They would share the same waiting rooms. I mean, I've seen plans and this really makes a lot of sense. And with the Trillium Corporation willing to work with people, they can make the room to get these different lines coming in. Joe Varengia would like to get in and ask a question, but before he does, I have one that also would include the possibility of rail going out to DIA. Well, the key, the key there is, as, as uh, uh, some people have pointed out, that while Denver has been talking for four years about putting a rail line out to DIA, uh, it's only 24 miles, there's existing track half the way. While we've been talking about it, St. Louis has done it, New York, San Francisco, and one other city are about to do it. What's the other city? Baltimore. 
uh, they've decided to go ahead and do it. We're still thinking about it. Joe Varengia. Can't rail plans, especially for commuters, have been you know, run up the flagpole for years around here, and they can design all the waiting rooms that they want to, but unless the railroads give them access to the existing track, uh, many people say there's no way, no way we can do that, and the railroads have been reluctant to, to allow that access, at least up to this point. Well, there is that problem. As you know, they were going to have a commuter rail demonstration project using the fancy trains from Denmark but the, uh, the local folks forgot, forgot to ask what the railroads thought about it, and the railroads said, no, nobody, this is the first we've heard about it, you can't use our rail. However, uh, under federal law, and I didn't know this until just recently, uh, if Amtrak were to run it, under federal law, Amtrak passenger trains have priority over freight trains. So if push came to shove, uh, it's possible they could start a, I mean, it works on the East Coast. The difference being on the East Coast, you have a lot more rail lines than you do out here. A lot of places here, there are only a couple tracks or single tracks. And to talk about Amtrak stepping in is kind of opposite reality because they're cutting back. Exactly. I mean, Congress has cut Amtrak uh, from 398 down to 200 million, and by the year 2002, they expect to be getting no federal funds. Amtrak is pulling out of 42 communities, mostly in the West, uh, in November. And uh, so it's, it's becoming more and more a local thing. I mean, even, even Aspen is, is planning on putting in a, a, a light rail link 4.2 miles from its airport into town to ease some of the traffic congestion. Salt Lake City is putting in a 15-mile light rail link uh, before the Olympics. Uh, optimism out of bounds, or is there a real chance that this growth of rail along the Colorado Front Range can happen? Well, I think, I think there's a possibility. I mean, for 40 years, we concentrated only on building highways. And then they passed something known locally as ICE-T, and don't ask me what it stands for, uh, almost uh, four years ago in Congress, which said local folks can have the option of using the money for something else. They've used 80 billion of it for something else. It's up for renewal between now and next September. But people are realizing that just building freeways, which creates more and more growth, and just having people traveling in single occupancy cars is burning up non-renewable energy, polluting the air, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas trains, people, I mean, Portland is, is doing an enormous uh, construction project with passenger rail. Kit Miniclear of the Denver Post. Colorado's largest industry over the last many years has been agriculture. There have, of course, been downward turns there, but one aspect is growing, organic farming. Deborah Frazier. Corn, cows, and wheat still have the big dollar numbers and the big acreage numbers, but organic farming in the state has grown steadily for the last 10 years, and it's not just your sort of lumpy vegetables and your limp lettuce. It's just beautiful stuff that you'll pay double the normal price for at uh, some of the specialty markets. Uh, it's a combination of having a good climate and having a great uh, demand for it along the front range. So. If you provide customers, the growers will come. But sales this year will be about $10 million, and it's about a 20% growth per year now. It has been for the last five years. Um, it's getting shipped more. Restaurants use it as people prove they can produce a quality product year after year, and more of them are getting greenhouses, so it's year in, year out. Uh, restaurants will commit to it, too, because nobody wants to have to send the cook out at the last minute for some more salad greens. And, and the key is these restaurants are willing to pay more for the organic just because they know they can bring in a special audience. Um, it, the audience is not just worried about uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, organic produce generally tastes better because it's fresher. It's closer to where it's grown. Um, it hasn't spent a week in some cooling uh, house or some packing plant. This week, you folks did a series about uh, harvest in Colorado of these farms and the, the uh, peach crop in western Colorado. Uh, I sense real optimism. In organics or yes, in? Uh, in both. Um, there's a lot of optimism in the organic sector. These are people who are, have followed their passion, as Joseph Campbell would say, and they're out there growing without chemicals because they really believe in food without chemicals. And it's working for them financially. They just happen to be in a good position for the market. Um, and so far, there's not much of a downside to it. One of the uh, organic farmers you talked with up in Boulder said, if you want to make a small fortune in organic farming, start with a big one. 
That is correct, and that is, you are correct, the big downside. If you've ever tried to grow your backyard cantaloupes with, uh, without chemicals, it's real hard. And a group of insects in the wrong mood on the wrong day will wipe you out. Debbie Frazier, State Desk, Rocky Mountain News. And in our final moments on this broadcast, we're going to turn to science reporter Joe Varengia. He has a challenge of major proportions. Explain the significance of the RNA molecule and health. Here we go. The, uh, we all have RNA. Tom Cech won a Nobel Prize in 1989 because he discovered, along with, with a guy at Yale, that RNA just doesn't carry the message, genetic message into your cells and, and uh, leave it at that. It actually can make the cells go. It's, it, it actually triggers cell function. And that's that, what they call a catalytic effect is very important because then it can act independently and be its own life force. What he has done this week, he has announced, is that he and, and others have modeled an RNA molecule for the first time. They have a three-dimensional model of an RNA molecule, all 9,000 atoms, and by now that they have mapped out the entire structure, they can really explain how it works. This may have major impact on how we treat disease. That's right, because, because RNA, we all have our RNA, and even a virus, as tiny as that is, has RNA. They hope to bioengineer their own RNA molecules in the laboratory to fight viruses by having RNA, good RNA, so to speak, attack bad RNA, take over the function in the cell for the bad RNA, and actually biologically replace it in a very sophisticated form of gene therapy. So if you were to have AIDS or another viral disease, instead of taking chemical medicine and trying to stop the virus that way, you would be fighting it with biological medicine. It's kind of a sort of organic farming. Get the, the bad one out and put a good one in. I think there's a lot more money in, in biological medicine than there is in, in organic farming. But really, the, the, the sense is correct in that, in that the chemical warfare approach in medicine has worked, but only, be, only at a devastating effect to your body, and a lot of times it's, you know, will the chemical warfare fare kill you before the virus does? So as we have used chemotherapy, a chemical warfare, possibly biological warfare could replace it. It, it might, and what they're doing is using this three-dimensional model of RNA now and growing their own new RNA uh, to try and replace the RNA that's causing the problem in your body. And part of the story of this week, Joe Varengia, is that it may also bring us more understanding of the beginning of life. That's right, because if we go back again to the fact that RNA triggers activity in cells, they believe that, that RNA was the original trigger for life in the primordial world billions of years ago, and that uh, with all the other life-supporting chemicals that were in the mix here, RNA provided the life force that was able to trigger the rise of life. That is yet to be proven. Science reporter Joe Varengia of the Rocky Mountain News. That is our broadcast for this week. For my colleagues, I'm Don Kinney. Have a good weekend. Funding for the state of Colorado is provided by the Adolph Coors Foundation, the Monford Charitable Foundation, and the investment firm of Piper Jaffray and its employees, looking toward the future since 1895. The State of Colorado, now in its 18th year, is produced in cooperation with Rocky Mountain Reflections. The State of Colorado provides background on issues of this week, Friday at 7.30, Sunday at 2.30.